Good morning, church. Good to see you here today. Happy Sabbath. Thank you to our praise team, our young people. Thank you for leading us in singing. Good to see you up on this platform. To all those that are visiting us here at Avondale Memorial, whether it's your first or second or third time, welcome to our church. And to all those that have tuned in online, thank you for inviting us into your home. And we hope that your time with us will be one that will be a blessing and one where you get to experience God in new and fresh ways. Now, if you don't know, we are beginning a new sermon series that we have entitled, When God Seems Silent. And I have the wonderful privilege to preach part one. And the text, the boundaries that I have to stay within that's given to me by Pastor Steve is Esther chapter one to chapter two, verses 18. That's where we're gonna stay but we will go through those texts. But to begin, I want to invite you to come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31. And we will begin our reading from verses 16. and We will make our way down to verse 18. Deuteronomy 31. And we will begin at verse 16, make our way down to 18. Follow along as I read. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers, meaning he's about to die. Then this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering, and they will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them, and they will be devoured. And many evils and troubles will come upon them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? 18. And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil that they have done, because they have turned to other gods. This is the word of my Father. I invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Gracious Father in heaven, Jesus, your mighty Son, and eternal Spirit. Father, we pray that your Spirit would just fall afresh on us so that you can, through your word, create in us a desire to be more conformed to the image that is your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we give you full permission to lead us and guide us and walk before us, and may we choose to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The great influencer for the Reformation, Martin Luther, he once noted that he wished that the book of Esther had never been written. But we could take that with a grain of salt because he also said the same thing about the book of James and the book of Revelation. You see, Esther is a unique book in that it has unique characteristics. It is one of two books in the Bible that that doesn't even mention the name of God. Not one. Think about that. Of all the names of God that we find in the Old Testament, not one is mentioned in the book of Esther. In this book, we don't find the mention of faith. There's no reference to the law of Moses in the book of Esther. And no New Testament author refers back or quotes from Esther. It almost seems that as the people of God go through the trouble that we read in the book of Esther, as if God has hidden his face from his people. But nothing could be further from the truth. James Hastings, he has this to say. He writes, This book of Esther does not say much about God, but his presence broods over it all and is the real spring that moves the movers that are seen. The book of Esther is quite an important book. In Jewish tradition, it is part of what they call the Megillot, which is just called the Five Scrolls. And so in Jewish custom, they've got these five books of the Bible that they will recite at different celebrations or commemorations. And so you have the first book that is Song of Solomon. I'll have it up on the slide, which is recited at Passover. You have the book of Ruth that is recited at Pentecost, their celebration. 
you also have the Book of Lamentation, which is part of the commemorations for, uh, that they recite at Tishba'av. This is where they describe the destruction of Jerusalem, in particular, the temple. Ecclesiastes is recited at the Feast of Tabernacles. And then we have the Book of Esther, which is cited at the Feast of Purim. Now, if you've been a Christian long enough and you know your Bible quite well, especially the Pentateuch, then you would know that in the book of Leviticus that one of these feasts do not appear in the book of Leviticus. And that would be the feast of Purim that we find in Esther. Because this feast is inaugurated in this book and it's still practiced by the Jews today. Without the book of Esther we would have no insights into the Jews that remained in Babylon. You know, God had set his people into Babylon and the Babylonians had carried them into captivity. In 539 BC, Medo-Persia, they conquer Babylonian Chaldean Empire. And then there's a decree that goes out freeing God's people to return to Jerusalem. Now, scholars, as well as Ellen White in Prophet and Kings, tells us that 50,000 people, Jews, returned back to Jerusalem, but the majority of them remained in Babylon. Now, for those that returned to Jerusalem, we have insights what happened there through the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. But for the Jews that remained in Babylon, we get insights from the book of Esther. So Esther is a good book. God has Esther here for a specific season, for a very particular reason. And Ellen White, in regards to the book of Esther, she has this to say from Prophet and King. She says, Satan worked at this time to counterwork the purposes of God. And as we journey through the four-part series of this particular, when God seems silent, you're gonna see how Satan worked against and plotted against the people of God, but God is gonna win. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a home where my mother seemed like she had eyes in the back of her head. Did you grow up with a mother like that? I mean, it was amazing. I remember she would make dinner and I would be sitting at the dinner table and, you know, there would be food there and it was smelling good and I wanted to eat because I was the only one at the table. No one had come yet, so we couldn't eat until everybody was at the table. And so the food was smelling good. I looked at the table and there was this beautiful chicken that was sitting there. And then there was, there was this, the Islander salad, which is taro and pota- you know, potatoes and, and sweet potato and, and balsami. All of that was there on the table. Well, being a cheeky boy, I wanted to get something before the rest of my family came to the table. So I quickly looked over to where my mom was and her back was facing me. And so I thought I could sneak a drumstick. So there I was, just reaching out slowly, ever so quietly, keeping my gaze upon my mom. And there she was, just facing the opposite way. Don't you dare, boy, or I'll slap you into next week. Being a Samoan woman, she could slap me into next year, man. The Samoan women are built strong. And it just seemed like my mother had eyes in the back of her head. I mean, there were times when she would be on one side of the house and us kids were being naughty on the other side of the house and we could hear the rebuke coming across the house as if she was in the same room as us. It was truly amazing. I remember that she would fold our clothes and put it neatly on our beds. Our socks would be in the pile, our T-shirts in the pile, our pants and, you know, all of it was neatly folded. And so we wanted to, you know, we just got home, so we wanted to go play with the kids on the streets. And so we quickly grabbed all the clothes, and just as we're about to throw it into the cupboard, we hear, don't you dare throw those clothes in the cupboard that I folded. I spent hours folding those clothes. How how does she know? It almost seems like she didn't just have eyes in the back of her head. It seemed like she had eyes everywhere. There was nowhere we could go without mom knowing. And I don't know if you grew up with such a mom, but it was just an amazing thing that she had as we were growing up. You know, sometimes in our lives when we think that God is not there and when God seems silent, he's always present. There's those moments where we feel like we're under attack and we can't, see, we can't experience God. We're not, we don't feel that he's near to us. 
and we feel that God's eyes has been taken away from us, he's no longer caring for us. I want to encourage you with 2 Chronicles 16.9 that for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give support to those whose heart is blameless towards him. His eyes are never leaving you. He's always watching us. Now to the story of Esther. In Esther chapter 1, we are introduced to a king. Now if you're not a Christian, this message will encourage you because you're going to see how, how history and the Bible come together. You're going to see that this book is not just a book that's been made up, but history will affirm it. And so now in the days of Azarus, who, uh, who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. This king is better known by his Greek name, Xerxes. His empire stretched from modern-day Libya, which was in Africa, all the way to Pakistan in Asia. Now, they say that estimated 50 million people lived in this empire. What's important for us to note is that Xerxes is the grandson of King Cyrus, who defeated King Nebuchadnezzar and served the decree that freed the Jews to return home to Jerusalem. What's also important for us to note is that Xerxes is the son of King Darius, who fought the Greeks at the Battle of Marathon. Now, the Battle of Marathon is made famous by the man that ran 26 miles, which is 46 or 42 kilometers, where we get the distance of the marathon run that we get today. Now, Darius... He was enraged and just had this fuel against the Greeks. And he wanted to avenge the defeat that he had at Marathon, but he passes away before he can enact his vengeance against Greece. This vengeance would fall to his son, Xerxes. In Esther 1.4, it reads, while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp, of his greatness for many days, 180 days the celebration went for. Six months celebration. What a party. We don't even party that long for our birthdays. But what we learn is the reason why they have a six-month feast or gathering is because the king is trying to sell a war plan. He wants to fight the Greeks, and he wants to do it quickly. So they have this six-month war planning meeting that is paid by the Persian government. Now, at the end of this six months, they have another banquet which lasts for seven days. And on the seventh day, they are drunk, and the king summons his queen to come and parade herself around the men and the people that were there. And this is what she says. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. Well, what were they to do with Queen Vashti's defiance of the king? Well, these men, they were a bit worried that some women's liberation movement was going to rise, and so they were like, we can't have any of this. And so they legislate that this should never be able to happen again in all the king's empire and that they needed to demote Queen Vashti. And so the seven princes that surrounded the king at this time convinced the king to make this decree. But as you know, you cannot legislate love or force somebody to love you, but this is what the king does. And now he is queenless. There's no queen and he's alone and he has concubines, but he is lonely. But I want you to catch this in the text. In Esther chapter 1, verses 3, it says, in the third year of his reign, and then in Esther chapter 2, verses 16, it says, in the seventh year of his reign. So between chapter 1 and chapter 2, there's four years that has gone by. And so history tells us what happens in these first two years when King Xerxes is queenless. And so what we know from history is that history affirms that between Vashti's demotion and Queen Esther's um, coronation, these two battles take place in history, the Battle of Thermopylae and the Battle of Salamis. Now, the Battle of Thermopylae is best known as the 300, uh, 300 Spartans, where they were led by King Leonidas, and they were just a little 
gap in the mountains that they had to defend to try to hold the hundreds and thousands of Persian army that was coming against them. But they were only 300 men. And so it wasn't long until the Persian army got through that barricade, made their way down to Athens, and they sacked the city. But they pushed the Greeks back down to Salamis, and this is where they have the second battle. Only they bring the power of the Persian navy. But at this particular battle, Persia is defeated. They lose 300 warships. And at this particular battle, Xerxes, he tells his men, 300 of his men, to build a bridge to go across the Hellespont, the Hellespont, which is this narrow channel between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean to help them get into Greece. Now a storm comes by and blows the bridge down and King Xerxes has his 300 men that built the bridge beheaded. Now, a Greek historian, Herodotus, he gives us an insight into the irrational anger of King Xerxes and how he acted against the queen. He tells us that he sent men with whips to go into the sea and lash it 300 times for breaking down the bridge. He also sent men with shackles that had the, the cuffs on one hand and then dropped the other cuffs in, into the sea and then stabbed the sea with red hot iron rods. This is the irrational rage that gives us insight into King Xerxes. But let us just take a moment to pause to see what God is doing in the background because he's not mentioned here. Out west, there is a king called Philip of Macedon and he's gaining momentum. And so this King Philip would then have a, a son named Alexander who would then grow to be Alexander the Great who would then lead the Greek army and defeat Persia. Now, when he is at the realm and he is the head of the world power, Alexander, he begins to build roads. And then these roads would later on be expanded by the next world power, which is Rome. But with these roads, the gospel would travel into the, uh, across the world in the most precise language known to man, which is the Greek language. So we're not just looking at Esther here. God is working behind the scenes to create the perfect environment for the New Testament to happen. Galatians 4.4 4 reads, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. God is preparing so that the fullness of time would come under the Roman government for his son to appear. Now, the story of Esther. The king is a bit upset because he's gone out to fight against the Greeks, and every time he fights, he loses. And so he comes home, he remembers Vashti, and he feels alone. And so the men that are closest to him, they say, well, let's, let's work out how we can satisfy the king and kind of lift up his spirits. And so they come up with an idea, which is kind of like the first Persian-wide beauty contest, or you, if you're familiar with TV, it's the first bachelor that ever existed uh, in mankind. And so what they do is they say, let's go out and survey the land and grab all the beautiful virgins and then have them come by the king one by one for the king to select a new queen. And it's at this time the Bible introduces to us two incredible, important characters Mordecai, who was a Jew. Mordecai is from the tribe of Benjamin. Later on, this is going to be important to the story. He is also a descendant of Kish, which will be important to the story in the coming um, parts. And he's also the cousin to Esther. Esther herself, she is an orphan. Mordecai raised her. Her name in Hebrew is Hadassah, and her Persian name is Esther. So now they're looking for a new queen. Josephus, a Greek historian, he shares that there was 400 women that were brought to the palace to go and stand before the king one by one. The text tells us that each of these women, if there were 400, had 12 months for beautification. 
what went on in those 12 months? I don't know. But I remember when I first came to college, I went to get my hair cut down here at Kurumbong, and I was in the hairdresser there just near the Australia Post. I walked in to get my hair cut, and there was a lot of women in there, and they had these machines, and they had curls and rolls in their hair. And I was listening to each of them walking out of the hairdresser as they were paying their bill. And it was $180 or $220, $110. And I'm sitting there as a student thinking, well, how much is my haircut going to cost? Where have I come? Do they put gold in my hair? Like, I was, quite, I was trying to understand what it was that women do in the hairdressers and why it costs so much money. But here, they had 12 months to beautify themselves so that they could present themselves to the king one by one. So when you read a bit of history, it tells us it wasn't just to beautify themselves, but it was also to learn about palace etiquette and how to walk and how to talk and how to appropriate themselves in the king's palace. So there was a bit of training. Now the story has it that in, in verse 17 of chapter 2, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. God's not mentioned, so we just got to pause here to see what God is doing in the background. If there is 50 million people in this empire, let's just say half of that is women. So there's 25 million women in this empire. I don't know how many beautiful virgins amongst these 25 million there were, but let's just take Josephus' number of 400. So out of 400 women that have to present themselves to the king, Esther is the person that grabs the king's attention. I have to ask, well, how beautiful did God create Esther to be? to be able to capture the king's attention. That seeing many women, hundreds of women, that she would be the one that would stand out in the crowd to capture his heart. But she becomes queen. Not because of her beauty or because of her character or charisma, but because there's a God that's working behind the scenes. There was a mother who was a Christian and she was an itinerant speaker. And she would speak all over the world, and she was an author, and she did podcasts and interviews, and, you know, she was quite a busy lady. Well, she had three sons, and she had a nine-year-old boy, and the nine-year-old boy loved to travel with mum. And so one time they were traveling, they were flying somewhere, and, and they happened to have a seat that was at the window where they could look out, and there was the wing. And so as the nine-year-old boy is looking out the window, he can see the wing, he decides to ask his mum, Mum, how is this wing attached to this plane? And mum says, I have no idea, son, but we have an uncle who works on planes. We have an uncle who does the, the electrical engineering on planes. Maybe we could ask him when we land. So as the plane came in for landing and the kid was quite eager to speak to uncle and so she calls the uncle and puts the uncle onto the phone with this nine-year-old boy and so the nine-year-old boy is talking to the uncle and he's like yes oh wow that's great the mom is looking at the son who's quite inquisitive and so she wanted to encourage the son to let him know that he could be anything he wants to be and so when the boy got off the phone the mother took his took her son and she looked him dead in the eye and said I want you to know that you can be anything you put your mind to, anything you work hard to. If you want to work on the plane like uncle, you can do it. If you want to fly the plane, you can do it. If you want to be a surgeon, if you work hard enough and put your mind to it, you can do it. If you want to be a preacher, you can do it. Anything you want to be, you can do it. And the son was standing there, looked at the mother and said, I know what I want to be. And the mom was quite chuffed and said, oh, what is it? And the boy said, I want to be like you, mom. Woo! Her heart 
was now flowing, overflowing with joy and love for the answer from this boy. As she was thinking about it and pondering, she was like, well, what about me does this kid want to be? Because I speak, I, I preach, and I teach, and I do podcasts, and I do interviews, and I wonder what part of what I do he wants to be. So she asked him the question, son, why do you want to be like mommy? And he said, I want to be like you because you do nothing. The overflowing joy and love that she was feeling had quickly subsided. So she turns to her boy, refraining from her anger, and says, son, what do you mean by that? And the boy said, well, mom, every time I see you, you're doing nothing. Every time I see you, you're on your phone. Every time I see you, you're on your laptop. That's why I want to be like you. I want to do nothing. You see, what this boy failed to understand, church, is that at some point, those clothes that are on his back are going to get dirty and going to need washing, and he's not going to do the washing. Who's going to do it? Mom. You see, what this nine-year-old failed to understand is that at some point he needs to, to, to satisfy his hunger, and if you leave it up to him, he'll just eat rubbish and carbohydrates and be constipated, and so he needs to be able to eat something of good substance. And who's going to fulfill that? Mom. You see, what this kid failed to recognize is that at some point he is going to get sick, he's going to get ill and he needs to get himself to the local GP or even check himself into the hospital. He can't drive. Who's going to do it? Mum. This kid failed to recognize that at some point his sheets that he lies and has good rest at nighttime is going to get dirty and they need to be washed and they need to be hung out and they need to be dried and then brought back and put back on the bed. Is he going to do it? No. Who's going to do it? Mum. You see, he thought mom did nothing, but the only way that that house was functional and operating and organized was because of the work that mom does behind the scene. You see, as you read Esther, God will seem as if he has hidden his face from us, but God is active behind the scenes. My big idea for you today is a quote taken from John Nelson Darby, says this, that God's ways are behind the scenes, but he moves all the scenes which he is behind. Alan White writes in Ministry of Healing, in the darkest days when appearances seem most forbidding, have faith in God. He is working out his will, doing all things well in behalf of his people. The strength of those who love and serve him will be renewed day by day. God is behind the scenes of your life. Trust him. May you be encouraged by the word of God. God bless.